Welcome to Cannabis Health Radio, a podcast where we share stories from people around the world who are using cannabis as medicine. The information is meant to raise awareness about the health benefits of cannabis, but should not be taken as medical advice. Now, here are your hosts, Ian Jessup and Corey Yelland. And welcome to another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Yelland. Our guest today says she was dying not from cancer, but from conventional cancer treatments. So she discharged herself from hospital and began looking for better ways to heal herself from cancer. Today, she is symptom-free and pain-free. And joining us from England to tell her story is Vivian Marksick. Vivian, thanks for doing this. We greatly appreciate it. Hello. Vivian, you've been diagnosed with breast cancer twice, once 10 years ago, and then again two years ago. Take us back to the first time, 2011, and tell us about the very first time you were diagnosed. Okay, well, I found two lumps in my right breast, went to the doctors, got sent to the hospital, had biopsies, um, went back, the results were, they were both stage one breast cancer. And I was told like all right at the same time that I'd be, have to have a mastectomy and possibly a reconstruction if that was suitable. And I needed a operation within a couple of days to find that out, whether, in, whether it was a, um, no, sorry, I'll take mm-hmm. that back. They didn't say it was a stage one cancer. They said it is cancer, but we need to do an operation to find out whether it's, you know, how bad it is. And it turned out that it was um, a stage one. And I was able to have a mastectomy with a reconstruction because I didn't know that there was any other thing that you could possibly do. So I just did that. Um, and then had the tamoxifen drug therapy for five years. And how did you react to the drug therapy? Um, I, it, it wasn't nice at all for me. Uh, I had the side effects. Um, I had tamoxifen, uh, and the side effects just made me feel quite ill most of the time I made my heart race all the time and it was hard to sleep and um, it uh, I seemed to put on weight and in the end I, I actually felt suicidal and I couldn't wait to stop taking it and whereas they would said it would be best to take it for 10 years I was like no way was I going to take it that long. Vivian, was this a hormone-driven breast cancer that you had? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. So they wanted you to take uh, the chemotherapy drug for 10 years. You stopped after five years. What happened after that? Um, then they just said, oh, you're all clear. Mm-hmm. And they determined that from what? Did they do a scan or something or...? Just um, I believe I believe I had a mammogram, but originally when I had the two cancers in my breast, it didn't even they didn't even actually show on a mammogram, even though you could see them through the skin. So you know, even though I just thought that's weird how they know I'm clear when they haven't even checked yeah yeah, that did strike me (laughs) yeah and I just thought well you know back then I just trusted that they knew what they was doing Mm -hmm. and just got on you know and I sort of seemed all right so I just got on with my life now in the notes that you sent us you said that as a result of the the drug therapy, the tamoxifen, you needed to have a hysterectomy uh, about a year later, correct? Yeah, yeah, actually it was um, it was a year later uh, because what happened while taking the tamoxifen, which was the drug therapy that I've been talking about, um, my womb was getting 
big swelling up and swelling up and I was, I know this sounds dreadful, I was just bleeding so much all the time and having stomach pain and back pain to the point. And, and I think I'd been into hospital at least once, if not twice, to have kind of biopsies done on my womb because they thought maybe I had cancer in my womb. But in the end, they decided that it was best just to remove the whole lot apart from my ovaries. Wow, you had, uh, so a year earlier, you had a mastectomy and reconstruction. Then a year later, you had a hysterectomy. And after five years, you were given the all clear. Did you feel a lot better after five years? Um, I felt a lot better because I stopped taking the tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. And because with the tamoxifen, I actually needed other drugs to help me deal with the side effects because I'd also by this time got quite depressed and was on antidepressants. And because my heart rate was so scary, I was on uh, beta blockers as well. So when I stopped taking the tamoxifen, I, I started to feel much better. So you felt better. And then in 2019... Tell us what happened then, two years ago. Well, it was actually earlier than that. It was um, in uh, in 2017, I was having a lot of back pain and it was, it was quite bad. And I had been to the doctors saying, oh, I've got back pain and they just prescribed painkillers. But then um, because it, it wasn't getting any better... I I kept going on about because I had osteoporosis as well. I was diagnosed with what they found just while they were in amongst having all the tests for cancer. Um, and I just thought that the back pain was just to do with having osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. You know, I was just guessing. Um, but when I had um, um, a scan they said that it needed investigating. And so I finally ended up seeing um, a consultant about my spine where they sent me for an MRI scan and that showed up a lesion and that was in 2018. So a lesion was in my spine and they said, oh, you know, you've got cancer. We don't know if this is a, a new one a primary cancer or if it's um, spread from the original breast cancer. Um, but then at the end of that year, they decided that um, they just decided that it was nothing and said, oh, look, you're all clear. We don't believe it's anything. Get on with your life. Um, but I, I wasn't happy about that. So I had more scans done and ended up having a biopsy which um, said that it was the original cancer had spread to the spine. So they, well, they call it metastasized. Mm -hmm. so stage four, um, not curable. What goes through your head when you hear that? Well, I was, I mean, I was horrified the very first time I had found out I had cancer back in 2011. But, you know, to actually find out that I had what they call incurable cancer um, was, uh, well, it was terrifying. Yeah. How long did they give you, Vivian? Well, they said if I had, if I had um, all their treatments, their uh, conventional treatments, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and I don't know, other stuff, uh, I could last up to 10 years. Mm -hmm. But I said, but then I, I would be ill for 10 years. I didn't really like the sound of being ill for 10 years. You know, it didn't sound like, you know, a great thing. Well, come because, on, be a good uh, sport. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thought of like sort of feeling sick and weak and not well. And I mean, I had um, had said I had you know, I'm, I have to look after myself, like my digestive system and that, because I suffer from 
I can suffer from IBS and stuff like that anyway, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is, uh, and so the thought of feeling ill all the time was not, not, you know, I didn't really fancy that. So what, uh, what were your next steps? Well, as soon as I found out the, that it was the metastasized cancer, because I had heard about um, oil, the cannabis oil, and I'd been looking into it and trying to find out where do you get this stuff and, you know, what, how does all this work? Um, I managed to find somebody because it's not, it's, it's, uh, you're not allowed to have it in the UK. Um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say, but, um, I managed to this get is the some. individual that I sent you to, I think. Is that what you're saying? No, it wasn't. It no, was not a, at that stage in the game? No. no, what happened was um, I kind of like found out, sort of got friendly with people that I thought might be able to help me. Right. And then when I actually asked for the help, said like, I really need some of that oil, the cannabis oil that gets, you know, that helps people with cancer. Can you get it for me? Um, which um, happened, um, but it was very expensive mm -hmm. and um although it i believe it, it it did save my life um it could have been a better quality great and um i mean i don't know if i should even say this but i actually grew some plants myself because when i realized how expensive it was and how much I was probably going to need, um, I, I grew my own and um, made my own. Um, and this is where Corrie came in because she helped me find a contact that, that I could trust that could help me out while I didn't have a knee and, and also help me to make my own safely and, you know, so that it's, I ended up with a good quality oil. But, I mean, while all this was going on, I'd gone and had some treatment at the hospital and was literally dying. <laughs> what kind of treatment did you have? Well, I had I had one fraction of palliative radiotherapy on my spine and um, I, uh, as I walked out of the hospital... I started having a bad reaction to it um, and like within 10 minutes I was like I had to pull over in my car because I was so sick so ill and had to be saved and um, the doctor had to come out and uh, give me an injection to stop me being sick because I was just could not stop being sick and being and diarrhea and Oh um, my gosh. You no, know, it was not, um, I was not, ex that was not supposed to happen. That wasn't part of what I signed for. That was, um, all, that was almost immediate then, you, you because they yeah. gave you this chemo and then you leave the hospital and boom. Well, it was a radiotherapy. I, I, oh, walked radiotherapy. Out, yeah, okay. I walked out of the door. I could feel my back was on fire mm. burning and I ran back to my car um, and I'd driven about two miles before I had to pull over because I felt I suddenly kept, felt so, so sick and was being violently sick, you know, um, like I just said, and which carried on into the evening until a doctor came out and um, injected me with an anti-sickness. It's interesting you say that, Vivian, because I was on the website today of the National Health Service in the UK and under radiotherapy, they say rapidly dividing cells, such as cancer cells, are more affected by radiation therapy than normal cells. The body may respond to this damage with fibrosis or scarring, though this is generally a mild process and typically does not cause any long-term problems that substantially affect the quality of life. Well, that certainly wasn't your case, was it? No. Did the doctors at the time know that you tried or were using cannabis oil? 
I I did speak about it when um, I was uh, when I went for the appointment and all my sort of family came along with me um, when they were telling me what treatments that were on offer and when I spoke about taking cannabis oil or alternative stuff I can't remember exactly what I said it was um, what did they say that they said that well the doc the oncologist said that he didn't believe that that would work mm -hmm. he he didn't believe it would work have you ever gone back to him yeah does he believe now um i don't know because um he's uh, we only have phone appointments oh, now right. because yeah. of the covid so he hasn't he hasn't seen that you know the last sort of time he saw me was i was in a wheelchair uh disabled from um i believe the radiotherapy do you know, Vivian, when uh, you sent us the information on what happened to you, you sent a couple of pictures before and after. I did. I sent those. Yeah, too. you sent those. And the before and after pictures are absolutely strikingly remarkable because you look in the before picture like you were on death's doorstep. And now you look like a completely healthy, vibrant woman. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And we're going to post those pictures uh, when we post the podcast. Yeah, it, it is amazing, um, you know, how, you know, how I made it because it really was against the odds because I was so ill. What happened after I had the radiotherapy was everything was a bit of a blur and next thing, I'm having chemotherapy about 12 days later. Um, are you in hospital at the stage or are you at home? Uh, no, I was still, I was at home. Um, and, but I wasn't well, you know, I wasn't going out or anything. I was just at home feeling weak and poorly. Um, then I, but I could still walk. Um, and then it was, so it was 12, about 12 days after I had the radiotherapy, I had um, the chemotherapy. And then five days after, about five days after that, I just felt so poorly that I went to the A&E, uh, you know, the emergency room at the hospital, mm -hmm. um, whereas upon they took me straight in and put me on loads of antibiotics uh, because I, they said I was had infection after infection and while I was in the hospital I just seemed to be getting worse and I I kind of had a moment in the end where I just thought I can't do this anymore it's too difficult. I'm in too much pain and I, my body feels so weak. I just, I just need to die. And that's how I, I thought that I was going to die. I actually thought I had died, if I'm honest. But I didn't, obviously I didn't. And when I woke up, I suddenly had a changed attitude and I just suddenly felt like I needed to get out of that hospital as soon as possible and, and do you know, forget what everyone says and just get on and do the alternative stuff because I realised then that I was on, you know, I wouldn't make it if I carried on with the hospital. You know, it wasn't going to work for me at all. And it was, so it seemed pointless anyway, you know, the fact that they'd said it was just palliative treatment. And I just thought, if this is what it's going to be like, uh, you know, I won't last long at all. In fact, I didn't even feel like I would last the weekend another weekend at the hospital i was only in there for a week well you look very very ill in that one picture extremely ill and uh it's just amazing how far you've come were you on oil at that point 
No, well, what happened was I took oil, and by the time it was time for treatment at the hospital, it had been about almost six weeks of having the oils. I think I was up to a gram a day, um, and I felt okay, actually. Um, so, but because I was having the treatment, I thought, well, I'm not going to take the oil because if anything goes wrong, they might, you know, it might, people might think it was the oil. Mm -hmm. Funny enough. So I didn't, but I, when I was in hospital and I was feeling so ill, I just thought, I just need to get out of this hospital and get that oil in me as soon as possible. And which I did, you know, I discharged myself. I mean, by this time, I'm a cripple in a wheelchair. Um, you know, I couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. I could, you no. know, and I, was, I couldn't even sit up properly. I was so weak. It was ridiculous. I just felt so ill and in so much pain. But I came home and I think I took three grams of uh, what they call Rick Simpson oil. So that's like... Um, cannabis oil. Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of... THC and well I took three grams of THC and three grams of CBD together and I was um I think I left the planet for that night uh, no joke. No joke. <laughs> Vivian, I can't tell was, was this day when this is you know when you checked yourself out there was this the stay where you asked for a feeding tube to be put in because you were so weak you weren't able to eat no no okay no no, so I came out of hospital and I got back on the oil and I started to feel better. But about so this was in this was in May I came out of hospital two years ago almost, um, and by July, by August, I'd I'd started going downhill. I was I'd lost my appetite. Um, I was losing weight. I was struggling to eat and then I started to struggle actually drinking um, and whereas I was supposed to be taking supplements, I couldn't even swallow them in the end. Uh, you know, I was uh, struggling and that's why I went to my GP um, and said, I, I need a feeding tube or I'm not going to make it. Um, and uh, my GP were put in a referral to the hospital um, and they turned it down but what happened was I had an incident where I think my body went into some kind of complete shock and I thought I was having a heart attack so um, I went to the hospital in an ambulance um, where's, uh, and while I was in the hospital spoke to them about needing a feeding tube which they wasn't happy about doing. I don't know why, because, you know, I it, it, it was obvious it would help. Um, but anyway, um, they said, in the end, they said they would do it, but I'd have to stay in the hospital, which meant they'd be doing all the food, uh, which it was not what I needed. Um, and obviously there to be doing all the medicating which I didn't want any more hospital medication you know I, I wanted natural you know I just wanted to do natural stuff by then and so I just said I'll oh, forget it I'll sort myself out and so I discharged myself again and came home and um learnt myself how to you know ordered all the bit was lucky enough to be able to order all the bits and pieces I needed and watch some videos on YouTube of how to fit a feeding tube and how to use it and um, just did it. Bringing do it yourself to a whole new level, Vivian. Well, it was like I said, do it or I'm going to die. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I get it. Do it or die, I said to myself, which was very scary. But um, I just thought, well, I'm going to die anyway. So, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, so, so that, tell us, uh, tell us what happened. Uh, so you're at home. You got the feeding. You put your own feeding tube in, and you're still taking the oil that you got from a source in the UK. 
And tell us how your health started to improve over time. Well, once I got the feeding tube in and I was getting fit food in me, um, straight away, obviously, I was starting to feel better because, and I was getting all good stuff in me, um, everything that my body needed and also able to get all the, all the supplements and things in because obviously my body had been so depleted by then. Um, and obviously the oil, I was, not only was I taking it, ingesting it, I was also, um, what do you call it, um, up your bum. Suppositories. Um, that's it. I, I suppose I, I made suppositories and I was also putting it in my belly button because I'd read that was another way. And I was also literally covering my body in it, um, you know, you mm-hmm. mixing it with coconut oil and just kind of um, just getting it any, in me any way I could. And then you slowly- But I also, because I was so poorly from what had happened from the conventional cancer treatments, I, I needed to take a lot of other things to try and get my body better because like my liver was burnt and you know all my internal organs were burnt from the you know I believe from uh the rate it felt like from the radiotherapy um so I, I had a lot I was taking a lot of different things to help get you know bring me back to uh, life and mm it was gradually working, you know, I started to turn that ship around. It was very difficult because I had to do this all on my own. What I had a journey. Uh, what the only you? support, I mean, I had, when I first came out of hospital, I did have carers coming in four times a day, but they, because I was literally just stuck laying on my back on my settee with a commode next to me because I couldn't even go and make myself a cup of coffee. I was, you know, even if I got in my wheelchair to go to the kitchen, I'd just feel so ill that I'd just just be so out of breath even talking. I'd have to just go and lay down for an hour just to recover from trying to get in the wheelchair or going on the commode. Um, But I I managed to get some people in here and there because the carers wouldn't, do any of the things I needed you know they wouldn't do food for feeding tubes or anything like that so I just had to rely on friends and um, my mum really and um, uh, my children to come in and make sort of do you know I'd tell them what to do because they didn't have a clue and they'd just make the food and then I'd have to do all the feeding myself and like some days I was just too exhausted to even feed myself through the tube. I was just like, I couldn't even do it. I just thought I've got to lay down until I've got enough energy to get up again. It was like, I can't, I can't tell you how ridiculously ill I was. I don't know how I did it. Vivian, in your heart of hearts, did you know that one day you would get better? I did because... Um, I, I mean, I have, I have faith in whatever you want to call it, a God, a higher power or whatever. And it was that that told me that I can do this. And I believed that I would get better. And, and I believe that that is one of the main reasons that I did get better is because I truly believe that I could do this. And whereas I'd kind of wasn't getting the help that I needed it made me very angry and what I did was I used that anger constructively to focus on making myself better Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know rather than moaning and groaning about everything not being all right I just thought I'm going to actually use all this anger power to make this food and force myself to do what I need to do to, you know, and and the, the amount of research I'd done, because I could do that, you know, for some reason, my brain had lit up. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was the oil, but I mean, that was the main thing I, I'd been taking. My brain had lit up. And although my body was rubbish, 
my brain just was taking in as much information as possible and I was learning all kinds of stuff to, to help me and how to get my fine my spine fixed so that I could get up and you know because I realized that I had to become responsible for myself and I needed to get my body better first and then like put in a go on a stronger detox so, so, Viv- so Viv- Vivian, when you were uh, at your worst, when you were just uh, lying in your city with um, and not being able to function in a normal fashion, how many months or how long did it take for you to get to March of last year, March 2020, where you were walking again without help and running again? Um. I think it was 10 months. So 10 months going from an invalid to a runner. It was this time, it was this time last year, what happened, well, because Mm -hmm. we just, it was probably about, um, well, it was in March last year that um, my daughter took me down to the beach um, because I still couldn't really do anything like drive anywhere Mm -hmm. she took me down to the beach and whereas I'd been practicing walking pushing my wheelchair you know getting up walking a little bit sitting back down again getting up walking a bit sitting she took me down the beach because I said I want to go down the beach and I want to try and walk on the beach without any wheelchair you know I want to I said and if I fall over I won't hurt myself on the sand so she let let me do that took me over to the beach and I actually ran about 400 yards and then turned around and well, well, jogged, you know, but the same thing back. And then um, and then we had lockdown whereupon I was shut in my house mm-hmm. for a month, told I wasn't even allowed out of my house. Um, so in in that time... I just did as much indoor exercise as I could, just thinking I'm just going to get myself stronger and stronger. And then I started, like, thinking I'm going to sneak out at 5 o'clock in the morning when it gets light, when nobody knows, (laughs) because there was a field. There's a field just near me. I know. Well, so I was sneaking out. Nobody knew, um, round to the field. And I said to myself, because I was scared to go without the wheelchair, but I said to myself, no, you're going out without a wheelchair, and if you don't feel well, you'll just lay on the floor until you feel better. And then, because I always would do that, lay down when I didn't feel well and then get back up when I felt better. And so I did that. And every day I walked a little bit further and a little bit further until I could actually walk a whole out for a whole hour. Wow. You know, some some days I might not have felt so good and I might have thought, oh, no, I'm going to go home early. I don't feel so good today. Um, but I also, I've got to mention my little hero, which is my dog, Honey, because, you know, it was her mm. that helped, you know, because she was the one that had to suffer no walks, being stuck in with me poorly all the time. And, you know, to have her to come out with me, you know, so it wasn't just me on my own. I had my dog with me, not that she could do much because she only, like, weighs five pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know... It was just, and to get out in the sun and the fresh air and everything and, and be a rebel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Helped, you know, so by the time um, the lockdown here in the UK had finished, I, I was actually, you know, ready to start going further and, you know, doing more things, going to the gym. And I actually last summer was doing paddle boarding and all sorts of stuff was your family surprised at your progress well i think everyone yeah everyone Mm -hmm. i know was shocked because everyone really thought i was going to die yeah that that, that's why i was kind of it seems that's why i was kind of left because everyone just thought you know the state of me i was definitely wasn't going to make it and they kind of it you know it was written that i was in denial of my condition and that and it it was written that I thought that I could actually make myself better and fit my own feeding tube and I you know it was written that I was in denial of you know how ill I was 
And I didn't actually know that until um, I read through some of my notes recently. I didn't realise they'd wrote that down. And yet, you know, um, I don't want to be big-headed or anything, but, um, you know, I did get myself better. <laughs> I, I did, good. you know, I did save my life because I know that if I'd have left it another two weeks, I would have been too weak to have to have done anything more for myself. Mm-hmm. Do you still take cannabis today? I do. I what happened? I took it like what I call the cancer dose, which was at least a gram a day mm-hmm. um, or more, and I took that for a year. And then I tapered off because I felt that um, I didn't need to take the cancer dose anymore. And I, because I didn't want, I was never keen on that high feeling. I don't know what you call it. I think we call it stoned. I don't like that feeling at all. I actually find it um, makes me feel paranoid and panicky. But I don't know, things affect people differently. I don't know if it was that or not, but I decided that um, after I tapered off of it to just have it in a suppository um, every night um, and I have it once a week now or if I was to, like, overdo it, um, not overdo, I mean, overdo exercise, like, say I'd been doing lots of housework or exercise or something and and my back did hurt then I'd use it then well you're Instead certainly like, you, you're yeah. certainly a fantastic testament to people who are very resolved to heal themselves through alternative methods and you chose cannabis oil which I think has made just a dramatic difference to your health and your appearance and uh, your mental attitude as well. Is there anything, Vivian, that you'd like to tell listeners in conclusion? Well, I when I came out of hospital really, really poorly, I'm telling you that the cannabis oil saved my life then because I was so ill and in so much pain that even though um, it wasn't, um, I didn't make, good enough progress from the cancer treatments it took away all my pain so which made things so much easier so it made me able to do the research and to actually do exercise to get fitter and all that I mean if I didn't take the oil the pain was too unbearable Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure what the pain was from because from the scans I did have done because after that I've only had scans from the hospital MRI scans because I refuse to have um, the other scans because they have radiation in them and I refuse to have contrast because that apparently that causes cancer um, so there's no way that the hospital can tell whether I'm cancer free or not because without the contrast um, that won't doesn't show them enough But I found my own way of doing imaging, which is not um, damaging to me. I can't think what the word is it, like invasive. Um, So, yeah, I found my own way to check Mm -hmm. my progress. But as it happens, I check my progress really on how I'm feeling. So, you know, if I can get up and and behave like I used to, you know, get up, run round, do my shopping, go to the gym, go running, take my dog for a walk, you know, do, I do a lot more exercise than the average person, you know, um, uh, before I had any kind of treatment. So I was starting to struggle because of the pain in my back, which was obviously caused by the, what they call cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I don't have that and the imaging that I do sh- shows me that um, I am clear of cancer and I believe that. Well, that's fantastic. I, so, sorry, Vivian, that's fantastic that you're clear of cancer and you have a, uh, just a wonderful story and we, 
We greatly appreciate uh, you telling your story to listeners, and uh, I suspect it will give some people some inspiration to uh, continue or even try cannabis oil. Thank you so much for doing this. No worries. Yeah, Vivian, thank you very, very much. It's uh, an incredible story uh, and uh, certainly a tribute to you and, and what uh, what people can can accomplish when they set their mind to it. Right. Oh, I forgot to say, I am actually writing a book at the moment because so many people want to know what I did because there's so much detail. Obviously, there's not time to go into all that. So I am writing a book explaining my whole journey so that and this book will just be for people to learn how to help themselves great idea so that, you know because i was left without any support and without that support it, it you you don't know what to do and like a book that would give people hope and know that there is support out there would you know is is what you know, what I want to give back for the help that I received, um, you know, from people that gave up their time to help me, you know, what to help me learn how to get myself better. Thank you so much, Vivian. And thank you. It's been uh, a pleasure because, you know, if this ha even helped one person, it would, that would just make me so happy. And we'd like to thank Vivian for sharing her story. If you'd like to support us, there are a few ways you can do that at Cannabis Health Radio. You can become a monthly subscriber or supporter for as little as $5 a month on our Patreon page, or you can make a one-time donation through our website. And we are very grateful for your support. And thanks for listening to Cannabis Health Radio. We'll be back again next week. Thanks for listening to Cannabis Health Radio. For more information and to search previous podcasts, visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com. Subscribe so you don't miss new episodes. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This podcast is made possible by donations from our listeners. If you found the information helpful, please consider making a donation in any amount through our website. You can also help us share our message by leaving a review on your podcast listening platform. We are very grateful for your support. Thank you.